All right. Well, um, your sermon notes are in your bulletins this morning, and I hope everybody got a bulletin. If you uh, if you didn't, we have bulletins in the back back there, or the sermon notes are on U version. If you have a, a smartphone or smart device, just go to live events and um, and um, type in uh, six three nine three five, and it'll it'll should come up. Um, should come right up. Okay? All right. Well, this morning I want to talk about one of my favorite characters in the Bible. Um, if you look in the Bible sometimes and you think, well, what character do I, did I, I wish I knew more about? I wish I knew more about. This is one of those guys that I just wish there was more in the Bible because I find him so interesting. Interesting, I find him so influential. I just, I wish there was more about him in the Bible. And although there's not that much about him in the Bible, there's been lots of books, uh, there's been movies, many, many sermons, lots of things written about this man. And it, it just shows what an influential character he is. He was a PK. His, uh, the angel Gabriel approached his father, Zechariah the priest, and began telling him that he and Elizabeth are going to have a child in their old age. And he began telling him all the things that their son was going to uh, be to them and their son was going to become and do. And he told him that they would name his son John. And his son would go in the power and the spirit of Elijah. He would turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, turn the disobedient to the understanding of the righteous. And by doing all of this, he will make ready a people prepared for the coming of the Lord. And that's number one in our notes this morning. Three things that we want to talk about this morning. That what does it mean to go in the power and the spirit of Elijah? To turn the hearts of the fathers to their children. And to turn the dis disobedient to the understanding of the righteous. Now, let's begin with what does it mean? What does it mean to go in the power and spirit of Elijah? Now, I don't think that... The Bible supports reincarnation. Okay? Just don't think that's there. So I think that going in the power and spirit of Elijah means that John the Baptist will come in the likeness of Elijah. Bold, dedicated. Elijah is another cool character in the Bible too. If you want to get in the Old Testament and start reading about Elijah, what a neat guy he was. He was very bold. He was dedicated to God, even willing to stand. Man, willing to stand against the powers, any powers. Doesn't matter if it was needed to be. And just to, just to tell this story, I love this story. In 1 Kings 17, we find Elijah approaching who? Who's he standing in front of here? He's standing in front of the king, King Ahab. Standing in front of the king, telling him that because of the evil that he has brought to the land, that there's going to be a drought. There's going to be an extreme drought. And what Elijah told King Ahab happened. Okay, here come the drought. Now, three years later, we find in 1 Kings 18, Elijah... Again, approached King Ahab, which was a very dangerous thing to do at this time. Because here, here Elijah told the king, because of your sin, there's going to be a drought. Well, the drought came, and guess who got blamed for the drought? <laughs> the messenger, right? Not the king. Um, so it was dangerous for Elijah to approach the king. But he told him and said, it's time for an end of all of this. Time for all this to end. Hence, one of my favorite stories. I have to talk about one of my favorite characters now. One of my favorite stories in the, New, in the Old Testament. I call it the showdown at Mount Carmel. I love this story. Okay? I love this story. Elijah told King, King Ahab, said, gather all the people. 
Gather 400 prophets of Asherah. Gather 450 prophets of Baal. And let's all meet at the base of Mount Carmel. Okay? Now, he said, here's what you do. All your prophets go over here and you build an altar over here to your God and you put a calf on it and, and I'll come over here and I will rebuild the altar of God and I'll put a calf on it and you pray and I'll pray and whoever's altar explodes in flames will prove who the real God is. So this is what happened. <laughs> All that morning, the prophets of Baal, they prayed and they prayed and they cut themselves and they prayed and nothing happened. Nothing happened. About noon, Elijah gets out there. I just love the confidence Elijah has. Lord, give me that confidence. About noon, Elijah gets out there and he rebuilds the altar. Puts the calf on it. And then what does he do? He starts pouring water on this thing, you know? He starts pouring water on it to where, to where there's a trench around this altar and it's filled with water. And then when evening time comes, the time that comes to pray to his God, he gets on his knees and he prays to God. And what happens? This altar explodes in flames. I love this. I love this picture. It explodes in flames. And all the water is just licked up. And Elijah, proving who the real God is, says, seize the prophets and commands the people to kill them. It's pretty harsh, right? Commands the people to kill them. Man. Man. So what was the purpose? What was the purpose of the showdown at Mount Carmel? For Elijah to keep his religious beliefs to himself? Didn't quite seem that way, did it? <laughs> he has all the people. Who's there? Who's there at the base of this mountain? It's, all, it's the people. It's the king. It's, it, it, it's, it's the prophets over here of this whatever belief it is. Is he keeping his religious beliefs to himself? Is the purpose of coming over here not to offend anybody? Was that the thing that he was to do? Was not, let's not offend anybody. I want to tell who the real God is, but let's be careful and not offend anybody. Was he worried about not offending anybody when he said, take those 850 prophets and kill them? Do away with the evil that's in this land. Or was, or was he really cautious about not getting involved in political issues? Who did he confront to begin with? Whose idea was it? He was led by God, but whose idea was it for the showdown at Mount Carmel? Elijah approached the king. And said, it's time we see who the real God is. One of the things that the angel Gabriel said John the Baptist was going to do was to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And he's going to come in the power and spirit of Elijah. What do you think it means to come in the power and spirit of Elijah? Elijah. Next, the angel Gabriel, he said that John the Baptist will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. Now, why did he say this? When you think about, here's John the Baptist, the guy, the, 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 the precursor of Jesus Christ. He's coming to make the uh, people ready for the coming of the Lord. And he says, one of the things that John the Baptist is going to do is make right, is, is turn the, the hearts of the father to the children. What? Why would he say that? And here's where I could break out into another Father's Day message. 
how many of our social problems, the people, how many of our social problems today and even back then and forever begin in the home? The structure of the home has everything to do with the structure of society. And that's number two in our sermon notes. I believe this wholeheartedly. Anybody that works in the school system knows this for sure. Ninety-eight percent of imprisoned men have contact with their mothers. Two percent have contact with their fathers. Boys without fathers in their lives are 63% more likely to run away. That's over half. 63% more likely to run away from home. 37% more likely to do drugs. Boys and girls are twice as likely to drop out of school or go to jail. And four times more likely to have behavior problems if they do not have a strong fatherly influence in their lives. A child's identity as an adult is strongly influenced by the father. I'm afraid today that a godly father, what we would call a godly father, that, that disciplines his children, that stands for the moral principles that is found in God's word, that teaches his children to discriminate against the evil in this world would be viewed as detrimental to their children. And one of the great problems that we have today is that fathers are believing this. Some will say that the need to turn the heart's uh, the fathers to the children is, is, is in reaction to the disobedience of children and the neglect of parents. And that may be true. That may be true. But I believe if, if we lose the true definition of what the structure of a family truly is, we will curse the society. If we lose that definition of what a family is supposed to be, According to God's word, it will absolutely curse the society. Lastly, to change the understanding of the disobedient. And we find in Luke 3, 7 through 14. Then he said to the multitudes that came, this is John the Baptist. Then he said to the multitudes that came out to be baptized by him. Brood of vipers, who warns you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance. And, and do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. And even now the axe is laid at the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and it is thrown into the fire. So the people ask him saying, what shall we do then? He answered and said to them, he who has two tunics, let him give to him who has none. And he said, he who has food, let him do likewise. Then the tax collectors also came to be baptized and said to him, teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, collect no more than, than what is appointed for you. Likewise, the soldiers asked him, saying, well, what should we do? So he said to them, do not intimidate anyone or accuse falsely. And be content with your wages. Finally, we get to talk a little bit about John the Baptist. I said we were going to talk about John the Baptist, but really I haven't been talking that much about him. One thing I like about John the Baptist is that he doesn't seem fake. 
I don't like fake. He just, I mean, he's, he's just this guy. He's just this guy. He's living, he's living in the wilderness. He's wearing a camel hide, okay? The Bible says that, that he's, he eats um, uh, wild honey and locusts. Okay, so they're not really going to, you know, it's not really going to impress too many people like this, is he? You know, it seems to me like John the Baptist was a guy who was not worried about impressing anybody or proving anything to anyone. I like that. We need to be that people. Don't we? Man, we need to be that people, especially as Christians, we need to be that people. I'm not saying that we need to have, just have a, a, a diet of locusts and honey, but, but we need to be real. I, you've, well, I'll get off my soapbox, but you've heard me say so many times, I get so frustrated at Sunday Christians. Man, we got to live it all week. We got to live it all week. John, John is baptizing down at the Jordan River, okay? And here comes a bunch of people. And what's the first thing that John says? What's the first thing that John, here comes, John has got a movement going on, all right? John, there's people down there being baptized by John. John's preaching to them. There's followers of John the Baptist. And here comes, here comes a group of people, visitors. Yes, visitors are coming. And what's the first thing he says? You brood of vipers. It's like seeing you bunch of snakes. Is that what you say to your visitors? <laughs> Maybe we can learn. Maybe we can learn something from John. By doing so, John immediately weeded out those who came to be pleased and those who came to be changed. And that's number three. The Bible doesn't say that everybody stayed. The Bible doesn't say that everybody stayed. Maybe when he called those folks a bunch of snakes and they stayed, maybe they realized they were a bunch of snakes. And it was time for a changed life. Anybody been there? Maybe it is time for me to change. Maybe it is time for my sins to be washed away. I want to change life. The problem, and you've heard me preach this before too, the problem with so many churches. Think about this. How many problems do we have in our churches because people have come into the churches to be pleased and not to be changed. I've come into the church because I want to be pleased. You know, you know the worship has got to be like I want it to be. I, I, you, better have a, you better have a coffee house if I'm going to come to your church. Your, your, your children's ministry better please my kids. And your, your youth ministry better make my teens happy. Because that's why I'm coming to church. And you know what John said about this, you brood of vipers? He said, you come to be changed. In the aftermath of the latest political decisions that's been going on in our countries, I begin to think that the division between those who come to be pleased and those who come to be changed is going to be very clear. And I believe as time goes by, this division and this clarity will be even greater. Then we see John's message is not anything different than we've been talking about in the New Testament that we found the message in the New Testament is John saying your life here I'm going to baptize you into this new life and now your life is going to be all about rules your life is all going to all be about rules and technicality and 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 what you can't do and what you can't do is that what he said is he said your life now is going to be all about rules that's what it is 
It's not what he said, was it? He said, your life must produce good fruit now. And don't tell me, don't tell me who you are. Don't tell me that, well, I'm, I'm a son of Abraham. I'm of the right race. I'm, don't tell me that stuff. It's about the lifestyle that you live. Not the rules you follow, but the lifestyle that you live. And they ask for examples. And he said, you know, it's real complicated, wasn't it? They asked for examples, and, and, and John the Baptist said, well, actually, it's rocket science, if you really want to understand this. He said, look, guys, if you have two shirts, you see somebody who doesn't have one, give them a shirt. If you got food, and you see people who don't have food, feed them. How difficult is that? The tax collectors, and we know what the tax collectors was looked at in that day. They were the bottom. And they said, what should we do? Which already, when I hear that, I think, man, a tax collector is coming and wanting to be changed. He's not wanting to be pleased. He's wanting to be changed. And John says, don't take any more. That's one of the things they were so hated about was they not only collected the tax for Rome, but they collected tax for themselves from their own people. And he says, don't take any more than it's required of you to take. And, and, and Roman soldiers, the very people who are oppressing the Jewish people, and, and, and praise God, we got Roman soldiers at the river. Woo! And they said, what should we do? He says, look, don't falsely accuse anybody. Be comfortable with your wages, what God's given you. Is that complicated? Is that really complicated, guys? You can come on up. It's not about rules. It's not about regulations. It's about the lifestyle that we choose to live. I've really, although like I said, there's not a whole lot in this, in the Bible about John the Baptist, but I really have just begun. And maybe, hopefully, we'll, we'll, we'll continue with this. I never can say for sure because I don't know what the Lord wants me to do next week. But maybe he does. Hopefully he does. And we'll continue about John the Baptist. I think that if John the Baptist were alive today, he would probably be labeled a rebel. I think he'd be a rebel. Not only, not only by the social political group, but also by the church. Why? Because John's real. John's real. John's telling the truth. John's just saying it like it is, and he don't really care what you think. Man, we need more of that, don't we? It's time to be real. We are in the times where we have got to be real. John refuses to be controlled. He chooses to live on, 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 on principles and not tradition. He wants to be real. I hope we're all rebels today. What are we willing to stand on? What are we, a soul on fire. Man, what a song. I didn't know you guys were going to sing that this morning, but man, that's what we need to be. We need to, John, the Baptist, he was out there in that river. You're talking about a soul on fire? Man. And some of these people that he was calling brood of vipers, they were, they were the priests. They were, they were the Sadducees and the Pharisees who come out there, and he was saying, man, you're doing it wrong. It's a time it's time for us to stand for what we believe or get out. That's not popular to say in church, is it? But it's the truth. It's time. So I just invite you this morning if you'd like to come and if you'd like to pray, where am I today? 
where am I? I'm ready to be that. That song says I'm waiting to be that soul on fire. Are we waiting? Are we waiting for that opportunity or waiting for that chance? Are we waiting for the right leading? Man, the time is now. The time is ripe. What do you choose to be? I'm going to leave that with you. Come if you will.